Good evening. Hello, welcome. It's wonderful to be with you tonight. My name is Jennifer Bernstein, and I'm the CEO and president here at the New York Botanical Garden. What a pleasure it is to welcome you all to Ross Hall for this incredibly special event. Before we begin, let us acknowledge that the New York Botanical Garden is located in the ancestral homeland of the Lenape Delaware people. We honor them and acknowledge their displacement, dispossession, and continued presence. Tonight, we are honored to welcome contemporary, award-winning visual artist, Ebony G. Patterson. <laughs> Ebony, I, I think you have some fans here. <laughs> Along with director and chief curator of the Studio Museum in Harlem, Thelma Golden. Here to celebrate the opening of Patterson's expansive, thought-provoking exhibition here at the Garden. The exhibition, Things Come to Thrive in the Shedding, in the Molting, is the culmination of a years-long engagement between the artist and the garden, and is the product of Patterson's longstanding interest in gardens and nature. To create this truly immersive exhibition, she worked directly with our grounds and resources to form a new body of work that includes sculptures, installations, and interventions with living plants. We can say with confidence that you have never seen anything like Ebony G. Patterson's exhibition here at the Garden. This work is completely new, yet retains the themes that have driven her previous exhibitions, including questions about race, class, gender, and violence. Among her immense talent and her many accolades, Ebony G. Patterson was most recently awarded the 2023 David C. Driscoll Prize by the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. Thelma Golden is the director and chief curator of the Studio Museum, Museum of Harlem, the world's leading institution devoted to visual art by artists of the African diaspora. Having begun her career at the Studio Museum, Golden joined the Whitney Museum of Art in 1988, where she launched her curatorial practice, including watershed exhibitions such as Black Male, Representations of Masculinity in America, in American art, and participating as a member of the curatorial team for the Whitney's groundbreaking 1993 biennial. Golden returned to the Studio Museum in 2000. Throughout her distinguished career, Golden has highlighted visionary work that explores representations of race, gender, class, violence, and other themes in order to inspire reflection, conversation, and action. Golden has long been a champion of Patterson's work, hosting the exhibition when they grow up at the Studio Museum in 2016. With her wealth of insight and previous previous experience working with the artists, she is the perfect person to be here tonight. So now please silence your cell phones so that we can all enjoy the conversation and join me in welcoming Ebony G. Patterson and Thelma Golden to the New York Botanical Garden. Thank you and good evening to you all. I bring greetings from Harlem. It is so fantastic to be here at a cultural institution I love in you know our adjacent neighborhood. You know, people who you know think of New York City as below 96th Street, you know, when they say uptown, they're just including all of us, right? Harlem, the Bronx, New Haven, right? All of that <laughs> is uptown. But you know, for those of us who know and love what it means to be in these northern stretches of New York, it is incredible to be in community always. Um, with the Bronx from Harlem. Also, thank you, Jennifer, and to the whole team here uh, who invited me to be here in conversation. The introduction said that perhaps I'm the best person, maybe not, but I am the luckiest person because I get to be in conversation with an incredible, inspiring artist, Ebony Patterson. Thank you, Thelma. 
So as was said, our history is bound um, around the ways in which your work has expanded us, inspired us, engaged us at the Studio Museum, beginning actually with your inclusion in the 2012 exhibition, Caribbean Crossroads, which was a groundbreaking multi-institutional project initiated, conceived by the Queens Museum, then directed by Tom Finkelpearl. Um, Tom came up with the idea for this exhibition and then asked the Studio Museum in Harlem and El Museo del Barrio to join. And so our three institutions created a really um, landmark exhibition looking at art and artists in the Caribbean spread across the three institutions at the same time. And we were lucky at the Studio Museum to have Ebony's work um, on the walls of what was the Studio Museum. Um, as you all know, we've been closed for a couple of years because we're building a new building. But the way in which I remember that building, our old building, that no longer exists is through the many ways in which artists work animated those walls. And so 2012 Caribbean Crossroads. And then, of course, in 2016, when they grow up, your amazing exhibition that was curated by the fantastic Lauren Haynes. And that exhibition, Ebony, gave us a chance to exist in community with your work and having your work really, truly create space for reflection, for engagement, for grieving. And it was such a profound way to understand the possibilities of institution and it forever made me understand that potential. So I have to say that the exhibition carved out space that will continue um, as we think about our future for artists to come. So I'm very grateful to you for that. Thank you, thank you. So we are here tonight on the occasion of this historic event, your engagement here in this exhibition project at the New York Botanical Garden, the first kind of immersive embedded residency of a contemporary artist, resulting in what everyone I know is eager to see. But before we talk about the exhibition here, I'd like you to first tell us when you knew you were an artist. Oh boy. <laughs> um, I have to say, I declared to my parents um, when I was around eight or nine that I was going to be an artist. I'm not quite sure um, how I came to know this, um, but my mom and my dad, my, my, uh, both my parents taught me how to draw. Um, and uh, which is in, when when thinking about like their own experiences with art, which was like non-existent. So my dad taught me how to draw birds, and my mother taught me how to draw people. My Your mother's mother actually sitting here. right here. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, both my parents came from like really uh, deep, humble roots uh, in Jamaica. I, I remember also too, like my mom would uh, talk about wanting to be, um, you know, like always being interested in drama, always being interested in theater, but because she was the first of nine children um, coming from a, a poor rural background, she had a, a greater responsibility um, to help with her family's response, uh, with our family. But then also too, I always remember on Saturday mornings, my father in his tighty whiteies, mm -hmm. and he would always dance. Mm -hmm. So there was always this sense of, I think, um, uh, expression mm -hmm. that was always cultivated in the house. Um, it also, I remember like my first trip to, uh, to, uh, to the UK, um, there was a painting that was on the wall of the Tate. I cannot remember the name of it. Um, but when I saw the painting, I, I said to myself, but I grew up with this work in my house. Mm -hmm. And so it was, um, it was a it was a Gleichi painting um, uh, that was in the home that my parents shared, and so I think it took me a long time also to to recognize how these pictures that were on the wall also created space for uh, uh, stimulation of making images, 
Um, and there were two images um, of my parents. They both had their portraits um, done when they went to Disney World uh, before I was born, um, during their honeymoon phase. <laughs> um, and I would draw these pictures repeatedly. Uh, my dad died a couple years ago. Um, and when I um, moved into my home, um, it's one of the things that I uh, that was missing, and I, I was finally able to reunite uh, these portraits of my parents in my home in Jamaica, which is which only for me further reinforce these early lessons, mm -hmm. um, these early seeds that they planted, um, and never knowing what that would then germinate. Mm -hmm. And so what that led to, right, that sort of rich support that got you there was going to art school. Yes. But when you went to art school, mm -hmm. you had to find yourself as an artist. Can you talk about what it meant to then go and be trained as an artist, yeah. but have to perhaps create your own training to become the artist we see today? Right. I um, So I, uh, I went to art school in Jamaica, um, Edna Manley College of the Visual and Performing Arts, <laughs> only art school of its kind in the English-speaking Caribbean. Um, and uh, I mean, the school was at the time when I was there as a student was incredibly rigorous because there was also an understanding that um, there wasn't a graduate program. So very few uh, students um, would have the opportunity even to imagine going on to further studies. It was very incredibly rare and also incredibly expensive to do. Um, so the, the, the program was so rigorous that there was an expectation of our teachers that they were preparing us to be their colleagues immediately. Um, and they took that quite seriously. Um, and I remember, uh, even during the times when we were, uh, when we were at school, there was this uh, expectation that we were supposed to be there all the time. Um, lots of times professors would pop up in the middle of the night to see who was there or not. And then the next day they would call you out and say, hey, I passed there at two o'clock in the morning and I didn't see you working. Uh, but was, what was also incredible about that experience also too is that these, these teachers um, who were also, of course, practicing artists, they also demonst uh, demonstrated this very clear sense of practice um, um, uh, through sharing their own work with us. But then also too, I remember one of my teachers every morning every morning he would come to class and his toes were drenched in paint. So there, this was also a very clear indication that I'm not just holding your feet to the fire, look at my feet, they mm -hmm. are also in the fire. Mm -hmm. um, and I always, I always remember these moments quite fondly. Um, and one of my teachers, um, you know, she and I, we talk constantly. Um, she was my first installation teacher. Um, she was my installation mm -hmm. teacher, um, and I'm really looking forward to her coming to see the show later on this year. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as a student, you were making work, but what kind of, what were you thinking about that was influencing the work? What, were there artists that you were looking at, things you were reading? And I want you to answer that broadly, but also, I want you to also cite that in the specificity of you being in Jamaica yeah. at that point. Yeah, I mean, I... I had a lot of questions at the time as a young person about myself, you know, um, which I don't think is um, is unusual. So there was a time I think when like I was, you know, like going through questions around um, around uh, gender, um, the expectations or notions around femininity, thinking about Jamaica also too as a hyper, um, even though it's a matrifocal, uh, a matrifocal society, it functions on patriarchal rules. Um, what does that mean? Um, then I, I remember like in my second year, I went down this, this, this strange well of questioning, having questions about like black identity, but then also to what does it mean to raise questions about blackness in a space that is black? And I remember um, quite starkly um, when I was in second year and we had a visiting artist from Trinidad and Tobago, um, Christopher Cozier. And at the time I was writing, um, I was, you know, writing a, an essay for um, a Caribbean art history class. Um, and I, uh, you know, posed this question to him about when he first recognized his blackness. Um, and he said, I didn't recognize my blackness until I left until I came to the States for school, um, which is not strange because, um, you know, blackness of course exists in opposition to whiteness. And if you are the majority, one does not have to, to worry about 
um, what one is. Um, but so, yeah, so a lot of these, um, in, in, in the beginning, uh, a lot of my, uh, questions or, um, interrogations in my work dealt a lot with issues around identity, um, and towards like the last two years, they were deeply focused on, um, autobiography. And then that took me into graduate school. And then eventually I was like, who cares anymore? Um, by that time, um, I was making pictures of vaginas and I was like, I don't want to keep, I mean, who cares about my vagina anymore? It's time to move on. Um, <laughs> but of course these, you know, these inroads are not, um, you know, they're not unusual for, um, for a young person um, who was what I was. Right, and, and not unusual for an artist trying to find a path not only into their work, but into practice. So you went through your undergraduate career, knew you wanted to continue studying. As you said, it was rare for students to be able to pursue graduate work. How did that happen? Um, it was serendipitous. Um, I knew I wanted to go to grad school. Um, every person I knew at that point as a successful artist was a teacher. So my understanding about my survival as an artist was, well, I knew I was in a, or, or they were in graphic design. Um, and I knew that absolutely was not going to happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the only thing I could imagine, um, you know, based on what was demonstrated to me in my ecosystem, um, was that if I was a teacher, um, and particularly a tertiary school teacher, not a secondary yeah. or primary school teacher, I would be able to have time um, to dedicate to, um, dedicate to my my practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember um, there was um, the, the head of the, the dean of the assistant dean of the school at the time um, who was getting information from time to time from varying institutions um, in the States and, and otherwise um, about um, you know, graduate programs and Washington University in St. Louis had a very generous program at the time um, for international students. And so that is what made me going possible. Um, it was because I, I was able to get this scholarship. Um, but then um, what was also wonderful about the, the time that I was in grad school was that it also shifted the way I also thought about the reason to go to grad school. One does not go to grad school um, to become an educator. One goes to, um, well, if you're focusing on studio art, yes, okay. one goes to grad school to become a better artist. Mm -hmm. And so um, being in community with like-minded people, um, and it was a really small group, you know, it was only 20 people across both years, um, made that time of incubation really wonderful and incredibly nurturing. I had, um, you know, deeply supportive um, women, um, uh, uh, teachers were, you know, like I was in a, I was in a printmaking program and I was a painter. I didn't know what the hell that was when I signed up for it. Mm -hmm. I was making a mess, um, all the time, ruining blankets. Um, but you know, they were incredibly, uh, um, a accommodatory mm -hmm. and, um, and, 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 and also to opening themselves up further and further mm -hmm. to make space for, for, for what they saw as my growth at the time. Mm -hmm. But let's talk a little bit about place because you went from King Kingston, Jamaica to St. Louis, Missouri. Right. right. Talk about that. <laughs> well, you know, I was there and I wasn't there. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's the truth. I was, you know, it, it was, I left as often as I could, um, you know, because there was nothing there. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, during the course of, I mean, even the school took us out, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. Each year they took us to a big city yeah. to, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but during my, um, when I was able to save up enough uh, money from time to time during the semester, I would travel to New York. Um, rough it, you know, stay with family, go and see as much as I could. Um, and then every holiday I would figure out going home because I couldn't imagine, um, you know, not being home, not seeing my parents, mm -hmm. um, especially for, for, for the holiday. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also too, during the summer months for years, um, in the last couple of years of being an undergrad and, um, 
actually also too, a few years post grad school, I, I was also teaching um, in a summer program um, uh, focused on uh, working class kids who didn't have art programs. Um, and it was a massive art, um, art summer camp that would range any day from 90 to 120 kids. Um, and the age range was from like five to uh, as young as five to as mm -hmm. old as 21. And we would all be in the same room. Mm -hmm. um, but those, ex that, those experiences of teaching were incredibly rich, um, rich for me, um, but also to being able to be home, to incubate, to um, think about my ideas, to work through ideas that I was working on mm -hmm. um, in St. Louis also too became Mm -hmm. incredibly important. Mm -hmm. I think that exemplifies how important place is for you. I wonder if you might talk about the sort of place and space of Jamaica as it relates to how you think about yourself as an artist. Um, so, you know, like I, there, there are a number of things, um, you know, for me, when I, whenever I think of anything, I first think, think through the lens of home. Um, for me, all my ideas begin at home. And when I say home, I mean Jamaica. Um, although recently I've heard myself also refer to Chicago as home. Um, but that's another, that, but that's another conversation. We don't have to have that right now. Um, but uh, so all my ideas for me begin um, begin from Jamaica because so much of who I am is informed by that place. I mean, and continues to be informed by that place. Um, a lot of my work um, not only starts in my imagination, but I actually start physically making work um, from uh, from home. And then also too, I I had an incredibly um, rich community of uh, peers um, who are incredibly active, um, you know, during the time uh, that I was at grad school and post grad school. And so we were always having um, lots of conversations, either we were um, asking each other or using each other and each other's own, um, each, uh, each other's practices. Um, uh, we were, you know, like existing in true community. Um, and I didn't have that here. And so, you know, like after grad school, I spent a year in Virginia and then I spent 12 years in Lexington, Kentucky. And so, you know, the way I often uh, describe my experience in the States is, and especially in those years, it's a little different now, um, is that my sense of survival depended on going home, that I had to go home because I had a community at home that would hold me in a way that I did not have in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, so I would often say Lexington was uh, where I worked and Jamaica was where I lived. Um, and if anybody would track, um, you know, like what, when it changed on the CV, they would notice you know, they would notice those um, those shifts because, you know, it felt like I was on a 12 year residency. It was really a solid time to incubate um, and to focus on practice and to really push. Um, and being there at 25 on was definitely incredibly tough. I was, you know, basically the same age as um, so many of the, the, the students that I had. But when it was, you know, when it when when the times became incredibly challenging, I would always remind myself that um, this place is, you know, is just a path of the journey. It is not your destination. Focus on the work. That's why you're here. Um, continue to focus on the practice and it will take you where you need to be. And I think that's exactly what happened. But I'm curious if when, again, being away from Jamaica, m making work was then a way to recreate certain ideas of place in the work. I don't know that I I don't know that I necessarily saw it as a place of or a place or a point of opportunity to, to recreate notions. I think it what it did was it allowed me space to to dig deeper mm -hmm. into what you know what this place was mm -hmm. and what it meant, mm -hmm. um, what it meant to me, and also to I guess in many ways to also challenge. Um, uh, I guess my own um, experiences around mm -hmm. that, I, I, and I think that happens because of the because of distance. You know, when one's inside yes. of something, it's difficult to mm -hmm. see the thing. Um, and then one, when one has space, then it becomes, 
easier to mm -hmm. to be a little bit more critical mm -hmm. of that thing mm -hmm. um and so I, I i i think for me i don't know that that's necessarily stopped yes. you know i think that mm -hmm. every time even when i think about like the whole experience of having to deal with um or thinking through the the ideas that um led me down this um path in recent years mm -hmm. to what you know what has happened in the garden. You know, I remark going to Hope Gardens mm -hmm. immediately, which is a botanical yes. gardens, um, uh, which comes from, you know, like a colonial legacy mm -hmm. back home. Grew up going there, grew up going to the zoo there. And then there was something about leaving here with the questions that I had at the time and then going home and asking those same questions that caused a shift. Mm -hmm. I think that I'm always um, sitting in a place of shift in mm -hmm. relation to both places. Right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I'm not in any one, I'm not in any one place more than the right. other. Right. I feel incredibly equally um, uh, tethered. And then as a result of that, when I jump from one place to the other, mm -hmm. then it's just a matter of turning back and, and asking the questions mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. It seems like a very amazing kind of simultaneity, right? Yes. Of, of, of being. Yeah. So as your practice has developed, it's involved itself in many questions, right? Around thinking about identity, portraiture, thinking through ideas of landscape, still life, existing cross media, and thinking about painting mm -hmm. in all of its manifestations. How would you describe the primary concerns of your practice? Well, <laughs> so first I always say I'm a painter um, and people are often surprised by that, but I think it just has to do with like my inability to talk to unlearn mm -hmm. the way I was first taught. Mm -hmm. um, even during the course of installing um, the show here, I was like, man, you are really a painter. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're, and it's really weird that you're making all of this sculpture and you, you still mentally haven't adjusted thinking through this, mm -hmm. these problems in that way. Um, so one, I describe myself first as a painter. Um, and then two, I think for me, um, my work, um, in my work, I'm unpacking or thinking through ideas um, uh, around particular histories as it relates to um, as it relates to um, inherited colonial structures. Um, I don't think that we actually exist in a post-colonial moment. I kind of like question that in some ways. I actually think that we're still living in a colonial moment. Um, and I still think that even though, yes, on the surface, things seem different, fundamentally, things are mm -hmm. still the same. Um, and so for me, I am, uh, it, I, in my practice, I'm, I'm continually raising questions around these systems. Um, in the beginning, a lot of my work uh, seemed to be centered more and more around uh, the body in terms of a, a very um, figurative kind of representation. Um, as the practice has developed, I would say that the work has become, it still deals with the body, but in a way more metaphorical mm -hmm. way. Um, I would say somebody like Olive Senior, um, who's Jamaica's poet laureate, um, her, uh, there was a book that she did called Gardening in the Tropics. Mm -hmm. um, the suite of poems that she made in that, um, in that, uh, um, in that book um, also, too, I think gave me language and continues to give me language in a way that allows me to think about materials um, and image making um, with a kind of uh, poetics mm -hmm. and lyricalness. Mm -hmm. Um, and also too, like in, in, in all of that, I'm also, you know, like I'm also always trying to figure out a way, even though I, yes, I'm employing all of these tools, um, around beauty, which also has its own, um, shortcomings, mm -hmm. uh, because of the nature of, you know, people, we like pretty things. Mm -hmm. Um, I am also constantly trying to find ways to push my own self in that. Um, how do I make the work not just uncomfortable for other people, mm -hmm. but also uncomfortable for myself? Mm -hmm. Tell me, though, why, why you want to do that? Because that is, of course, one of the most significant things about your work, right? Your ability to allow us to have to sit with 
the sort of discomfort of beauty right up against ideas of pain and violence. Why, why do you want that to happen? Um, I think it's important, uh, especially when I think about like our relationship to images. Um, we consume images at a much higher rate than we ever have in our ever had in our human existence, all because of this little thing that we carry around on our person, you know. Um, and there's a sense of um, I think that looking, uh, the notion of looking is missed. You know, we do a lot of seeing, but for me, looking is um, uh, making sp space for seeing, but then also too, there's a process of analysis that comes into play. But then also to the other problem also too, sometimes with this device is that we don't know how to make space. And so what does it mean then um, for me as an artist to try and find moments in the work, not just to make space for the subjects that I'm thinking about, but to also get the audience to make space. Um, finding ways to create moments of reverence for bodies that are not seen as reverent, so that if a person decided that like, yeah, my attention span is too short, I don't wanna, I don't wanna sit here for like eight minutes, that just moving becomes irreverent and you become self-conscious in that move in that moment mm -hmm. um, and reroute and and remain again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in your work in your early work the figure in a very literal way was important can you talk about figuration and its relationship to both ideas of memory and memorial as they relate to your practice I think that uh, for me, when I was dealing with the figure at the time, um, like and when I think about like those really early large heads that I would make, um, for me, I wasn't even thinking about them as a figure. Uh, it's kind of funny that like, I, I feel like there's this, there's this thing that has happened like for me over the years in uh, like the way I talk about something or think about something hasn't quite caught up with what my hands is actually doing. Um, so for me at the time uh, when I was making these like really large portraits um, of these young men and referencing skin lightning, um, for me at that time, I was really thinking a lot more about the objectness of the body um, and also to um, thinking also too about the body as like a tool, uh, as a point of navigation um, that people also recognize the power of that, uh, the power of their own sense of uh, their own toolness um, and what it means then to um, use uh, something that's like incredibly violent on one's surface as a way of um, pushing one's body forward. Um, and then I think like from there, uh, the notion of uh, dealing with the figure for me then became a lot more narrative. Um, and I started thinking a lot about like the figure in multiples, you know, like what would what would happen if I if I began to expand uh, some of uh, some of the the, the passages um, within the reading of the work. And I think a big part of that um, that shift had a lot to do with, you know, like uh, I, I felt like the work was continually getting locked into a particular kind of geographical conversation, um, and people became, I think, like incredibly enamored with my being a Jamaican. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, I found that deeply problematic and I, you know, I am Jamaican, I can't, you know, like it's not something I can deny. Um, but I also find that uh, what happens then when uh, my sense of geography is constantly loaded on top of my work, um, then it, it almost creates it, uh, it almost only makes it for a moment you know, um, and you know, like there isn't the same sense of preoccupation around white men and white men artists and, mm -hmm. and where they come from. Mm -hmm. They just make and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, mm -hmm. you know, so these, so, so I wanted to, sh I, so I kept shifting, mm -hmm. kept finding ways mm -hmm. to shift. But then also too, I, I also, uh, the shifting uh, around the figure also needed to happen for me because my sense of thinking about the body was also mm -hmm. shifting. Um, and also to the ideas around the scenarios around the body was also mm -hmm. um, 
was also shifting. And I, I think that what I would say about all of these shifts, it's not that the work is um, any different. For me, the ideas are all the same. Um, but what viewers witness is evidence of my mind rethinking these ideas over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. very, very evident in the work. So as we get to talk about this amazing installation here, I'd like to move from content into form and have you talk first just broadly about this, though you call yourself a painter, this incredible multimedia practice that you've developed, working with all kinds of materials in different ways. Can you speak about that materiality? Because that's how we'll get to this very particular materiality of your installation right. here. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm a painter, but you know. I, <laughs> you know. Um, but what that means to me is that I use paint. I think about painting through language, you know, so that means then uh, for me that all materials are possible through that language. And so for me, when I think, when I make a decision materially, I'm, I am first motivated by its ideas. Um, I'm clearly not a purist by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I, you know, I do think, I do understand um, the wonders and the magic of, of pigment. Yes. Um, but I do really believe that pigment exists uh, in, in every possible um, way. But then also, too, I think that by using uh, different kinds of materials um, uh, and thinking about that in relation to the ideas, what it also sets up for the audience, mm -hmm. you know, like um, what happens then when we begin to recognize materials that we're we're familiar with in a kind of day-to-day -day experience. Mm -hmm. um, there's an opportunity where the um, where the audience also too um, sees themselves uh, within the surface of 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 the work, and and also sees the way in which the transformation of those materials right right sort of can elevate their meaning in right. the context of your work. So here we are. I, I want you, you know, this is interesting, audience, because I know you all haven't gotten to see the exhibition yet. And so we're going to talk about something you haven't seen. But in many ways, I was thinking about that in preparation for this. And that's often the experience we have as curators, right? We're talking to artists, and they are telling us what they imagine, what they are imagining um, as they are making work. And you exist in an incredible form of trust and kind of, you know, co-creation. Sometimes it's the same for the artist. Right. I only saw the work yesterday. Right, exactly. <laughs> so we're bringing you into that, right? We're gonna co-create here as Ebony begins with, first I'd like us to hear the title of this installation in your voice, and then for you to tell us, right, in your imagining, how you'd like us to understand this incredibly innovative and for you, new way, perhaps, of thinking about your work at, at this moment? Well, okay. Title. <laughs> that was a lot. Okay. All right, no, we'll, we'll break big, it down. Okay, let's we'll break, break it down. down. Break it down. <laughs> um, so the title of the show is called Things Come to Thrive in the Shedding, in the Molting. Um, and I would say, like, in the last couple of years, I've been thinking a lot about um, the word molting in relation to a peacock. Mm. Um, and that happened because after my visit in 2019 um, to the gardens, I'd gone home to my own gardens back home in Jamaica, went to the Hope Zoo, um, and then I saw a lucine peacock, a white peacock. I'd never seen a white peacock before. It was in a, um, a dark enclosure, and it was molting. Mm. It was shedding its, uh, its plumage. I, never, I, don't, I don't know that I can recall ever seeing a bird shedding. Um, but then also, too, here, here was this peacock, which, you know, like we tend to think of peacocks in terms of their majesty, um, their sense of pageantry. Um, and it, the peacock almost seemed to hover in this, um, in this darkened space, almost like a haunt. Mm -hmm. It was incredibly unsettling. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, 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 that image remained with me. I remember taking a short video of it. And then a year later, then I started to unpack what I, what I'd seen. Um, I, you know, like found, I was like, Hmm, I wonder if I could find a peacock online. Um, <laughs> so I found like a ready made and that's how I began. Um, I started by making a white peacock that had a tail that went up a wall. Um, but the peacock looked back at itself. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so the question for me in this look back and in this molting was like, what does it mean to witness your own ugliness? Um, and thinking about like the peacock as this like incredibly magnificent and beautiful bird, but it's watching itself. It's watching itself through this really ugly um, and difficult um, period mm -hmm. that, that's happening to its own body. Yes. Um, and then, um, so I made that work during the lockdown. Um, and then uh, it, it, there was some exhibitions that had got pushed back. So I had a little bit more time. So then I made a black peacock mm -hmm. after. Um, and then this peacock also looking back onto itself, um, its, uh, its tail, I started to think even more about the tail of the peacock, a colored peacock in relation to the landscape, how much those colors, um, look like, uh, the landscape, um, for all kinds of, um, survival reasons. Um, but then I started to think also too about what it would mean to think about the landscape, almost like a, a rug or a carpet, um, and going back to this like earlier thinking around gardens, that if a garden in a cityscape um, is an embellishment on the city, um, then what, what exists below the garden? If there's a garden on top, there must be a garden below. And what would it mean to pick up that embellishment? Um, almost thinking about this embellishment as something that is concealing something, mm -hmm. um, that the truth exists within the land, um, you know, exists within the landscape. Um, what would it mean to pick it up? So in that, with that peacock, the uh, the corner of it rises and a pair of legs um, jut out. Um, but when one looks really closely, one seeing a, like a cluster of red, it might look like root systems, but it's a cluster of all of these red lace hands. Mm -hmm. And so what it's suggesting, uh, you know, what I was suggesting through the work is that the landscape is drenched. Mm -hmm. It's drenched with bodies. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, what bodies th those are, are is, is infinite. Mm -hmm. Um, so in coming uh, to the gardens, I was thinking about continuing to think and to ruminate on these ideas. Um, and there was a work that I was developing at the time that I had gotten a, um, a grant from the Alturas Foundation. Um, so I started making this, this wall. I, I called it a wall in the studio for a long time, but thinking about this idea of a festa. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, okay, so if the peacock the peacock's tail picks up the landscape. Well, what happens when one thinks about, like, say, for example, like architecture that's abandoned, the landscape comes for right. everything mm -hmm. in the end. You know, it's like ash to ash, dust to dust, from, you know, from soil we return, from soil we, from soil we come, from soil we return mm -hmm. to. Um, so then what does it mean then to, I was like imagining, what if I like cracked a building open? And then just imagining that beneath all of that, the landscape is slowly um, coming back, um, you know, for the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, but then also too, if the landscape's coming back, then what else is it also coming back with? Mm -hmm. And so just thinking through the notion of a festa, the yes. word festa started to sit with me. Mm -hmm. um, and so this, this wall, which is actually upstairs in the rotunda, is a meditation on the word festa. And then for me outside in the landscape, I started thinking about, well, what would a festa look like in the landscape? What would it mean to, um, to create wounds in the landscape? What would that look like? What, is a, what would be the possibility there? Um, but then also too, at the same time, I was also working on other work. Um, and there was this one work that I had made, um, with three, um, with three, um, images of three women and right behind these women were a wake of about nine vultures. Um, and how I came to vultures is like really serendipitous, you know, at 12 o'clock at night. Oh, I wonder if I could find a vulture. Um, <laughs> And then you go down this hole of yeah. trying to find a ready-made. Yeah. Um, but then also too, in 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 also to just spending a little bit more time mm -hmm. um, thinking about because I've always been looking for 
um, points of metaphor that relate to death, that relate to witnessing. Mm -hmm. I started thinking about the vulture and what the vulture does and how that then also relates to, um, you know, the statement, men die, women cry, thinking about communal um, acts of violence. And when, you know, like stories are broadcasted, it is always the women who come. It's the women who tell us about the lives, um, th the life of the person that's on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought like, well, if these three women are coming to tend to our body, um, who, what else also comes? Mm -hmm. And so the wake of these vultures um, are also a part, of, uh, a, a part of this experience, thinking about the fact that what the vulture does through consuming the body is also an act of care mm -hmm. um, because by consuming the body, it means that regeneration becomes possible. Life becomes possible again. So that um, both sets of bodies show up out of an act of love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you received this invitation, had you ever thought about working in this way? So I'm really oh, yeah. trying to get at thinking about the site specificity of this yep. installation and, and, and how when encountering these spaces, this particular landscape, this particular narrative of garden, wh where did that enter into your thinking? Yes, yeah, so I, there was a project some time ago um, uh, where I was in, um, in conversation with an organization about planting a garden around a large glass sculpture. And at the time it was gonna be a toy car. And we talked about a number of institutions, a number of possibilities, but then it kind of fell flat in the end. Um, and then when um, in 2019, when I went to Crystal Bridges for a residency, um, while I was making work in the studio, I also had this opportunity to plant an actual garden. Um, and I kind of see this as, it was like a test site, you know? So I came up with this idea of, um, based on all of these plants that I had used in a prior show that were, um, all had um, poisonous properties, what would it mean to also plant um, not just plants that had poisonous properties, but also plants that had healing properties. And to think about the garden as a kind of metaphor for post-colonial space. Um, but I was also in really interested in this notion of like planting a garden that was meant to die. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about the garden as a site of survival mm -hmm. um, and possibility. So we planted this a garden with plants that normally would, I mean, this was in like the north edge of um, Crystal Bridges uh, Forest. Um, so a lot of these plants ordinarily would not survive or thrive in that environment because of the soil. Um, and then also too, there were a number of, um, you know, like animal life that also lived there. Mm -hmm. um, so I was also interested in the uh, possibilities of engagement and just what would naturally happen. So we planted in June, did only one watering and left it until November just to see what would happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I already had this taste, you know, yeah. this little taste to mm -hmm. do something. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I remember when I first came here with this idea, it's like, yeah, 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 we should just plant something and just let it all die. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Horticultural is like, yeah. oh my God, yeah, who is this woman? Right. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I just, you know, like I was, I guess I was just really excited about like this small, um, this, this, you know, like what I had learned from making that, uh, because that's, that for me is also too fundamentally what it comes down to. I see like every engagement for me is an opportunity to learn something and to take it back into the main beat of the practice. And so even when I was like making those works in the studio at Crystal Bridges, and then I was also planting this physical garden, there's also some something that also shifted even even too in terms of like the density um, that was being created in the works at the time. Um, you know, like I was, I remember thinking after the Perez show, everything that I've ever done at, at, up to that point, I would make a work and then build an environment around it. What would it mean to create the environment in one space? Mm -hmm. So to have to deal with an environment and then to think about creating the illusion of an environment was incredibly instructive for me, mm -hmm. um, you know, at that time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so in making this work and in imagining it and thinking about it, can you talk a little bit about how you hope the audiences here, 
the audiences to this garden um, will engage with the work? Well, I think, you know, that, that's not up to me in the film well, what would what, what would your ideal be, you well, know? I mean, my, I guess, you know, like when I, when I started, um, when we started our conversation here, one of the first things I thought about were like, who are the people that come here, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, thinking about these older, um, retired white women who would come. You know, and I just kept thinking, you know, about these women who would come because of the peonies or they would come because of the roses. And I thought, what would it mean to make the person who would come because of the peonies just a little annoyed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit, you know, um, because I think that there's a fundamental importance in like um, in understanding yes what this place or what places like this mm -hmm. um, come out of historically. Mm -hmm. This is not to suggest that, um, you know, like that engaging with beauty um, isn't, you know, like engaging with, you know, mm -hmm. like the experiences of pleasure isn't important. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't, we, you know, we don't want to sit and think about traumas continually, but I think it's important mm -hmm. to consider them sometimes. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And also to, to consider mm -hmm. how that then also relates to just, you know, the larger um, social issues mm -hmm. that we find um, discomfort or annoyance in dealing with. You know, like I, you know, I say, I've said to people, on occasion, like so many of these plants that, you know, that we love and we adore and we will adorn our houses with, you know, like they came on the same ships that bodies came on, you know, came over on in this great age of discovery, you know? Mm -hmm. So while, you know, plants, I remember there's a, I'm not sure where I got it from, but there's a statement I have on my, um, in my studio wall, a quote that I saw from somewhere saying that gardens are evidence of rape of the world. Mm -hmm. I don't know where that came from, but it is so true. Mm -hmm. And when we think about like all of the conversations around the way we think about people in terms of a social, um, in terms of like um, the socioeconomic hierarchies mm -hmm. that we've inherited, there's so much of that same language right. that could mm -hmm. equally be equated to the way we think about people. Mm -hmm. So I did think about that woman mm -hmm. who would come and look at the peonies mm -hmm. and just think, you know, how could this be the little pebble in the shoe that you just could not get out of your shoe mm -hmm. just for a little bit, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but then also to the other thing that's also incredibly wonderful about, you know, um, the knowledge base that's also here, um, you know, big ups to Brian and Todd, mm -hmm. wherever you are in the yeah. audience. <laughs> But, you know, like the, the knowledge that also exists here in terms of like when I said like, oh, this, this is like, you know, these are the plants that I've been, um, that I've referenced in other works. And they go like, oh, well, that's great, but that's not going to survive. Right. right. Um, and so, mm -hmm. so too, that's the other thing that's also interesting about the show is that like at no point does anybody come and have uh, the same experience right. based on, mm -hmm. not even just based on the seasons, but based on the days, mm -hmm. because things will grow, uh, right. things will respond as they do in nature. And, and transform. And they will transform. Mm -hmm. uh, but also to a lot of the plantings will change mm -hmm. from time to time mm -hmm. um, in accordance with the change, um, with the change in the season mm -hmm. too. So in many ways, a very different way of, of practicing for you than making works that exist in a static, permanent way. Incredibly difficult. It yes. was hard, you know. Yes. It's real hard. Right. right. Very hard. But very I'm hard. sure it's opened up some new, new doors. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I think that's, you know, like it's also, I mean, there's some lessons that mm -hmm. I learned along the way mm -hmm. from myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had to remind myself over and over again also too of like why I decided to do this in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I, you know, I also recognize like how unusual it is for an artist who is at this point in my, you know, in my practice? Um, what does it mean for me to decide to do a show here at a place that's not an art institution, but to make an artwork mm -hmm. with a place that uh, that is interested in working with artists? Mm -hmm. um, but also to fundamentally what that will mean for me when I pack it all up. Meaning, well, not pack up the actual show, but pack myself up yeah. and return to the studio mm -hmm. um, and what might come from, um, what might grow from there, um, given the experiences here, too. Mm -hmm. um, I'm deeply aware 
um, aware of that mm -hmm. and, and um, incredibly grateful for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I know, you know, just hearing from you about what this installation is, what it's made up of, what's inspired it, how it lives for you as the way that you quite literally could intervene into this space, but also in the way in which it resonates with, with ideas that have formed your work, been at the base of your work for your entire career. So what now that this is up and installed, what's consuming you as you think about your work in the future? I mean, one thing I, we should say, as you sit here as an artist and we are celebrating you in that tonight, also Ebony is a curator and going to curate the next Prospect Triennial, something that we all, are looking forward to, right? And seeing your view curatorially on how to think about art. But talk a little bit about, you know, what's inspiring you? What are you looking towards? And how might that be a way that we can understand where, where you are going? What's on the path for you? You know, Thelma, ordinarily, I would have so many responses mm -hmm. to give you, uh, mm -hmm. um, but not this time. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. I have spent so much time getting on to the next. I have actively decided that I just want to stay here. I mean, that's fantastic. I, I need to just stay yeah. here mm -hmm. because the truth is, you know, like I like I, when I said earlier, like I don't even know what it looks like. Like yesterday, we did the last mm -hmm. thing, and when given how long we've been, you know, been at it physically leading up to this final moment, just being able to have the space to understand what was done, um, I think is going to be incredibly important for me in terms of, in, um, in terms of how I will make the next set of decisions mm -hmm. to push, yes. you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think that there are, there, it, there is, for me, like I've learned a lot um, there are things that I'm really clear on, like the lessons that I've I've gained, but I need a little bit more time mm -hmm. just to sit with what I've done, because it's, you know, like we talk about the fact that, you know, this has been a conversation for about a year with the gardens. But for me, it's been like it's been when I think about Museum of Art and Design, when I first really started working with plant life mm -hmm. um, in that kind of way. And that was 2015 right. mm -hmm. so when one thinks about like that's almost 10 years mm -hmm. and now it's happened so mm -hmm. i need a little bit of time mm -hmm. to digest this mm -hmm. first well i think time is what we're all going to want right as we consider what it's going to mean to experience this work as you said to me earlier to experience its transformation i mean in some ways ebony the work isn't complete Right? because it's going to be changing right through the season. But what I know that all of us um, are grateful for is you and your voice and your vision as an artist that gives us these experiences to engage, to confront, to have space, to sit with, as you say, all of the histories right? that allow us to understand the world as we're in. But also I wanna thank you, Ebony, because your work always contains this incredible power that comes from the speculative, speculative possibilities that you give us in the work, right? To understand what it means to create transformation in what we see, how we see it, how we understand it. So thank you for this exhibition. Thank you for your work. Thank you for this conversation. And thank you, as always, for being an inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the New York Botanical Garden, I want to thank both Thelma and Ebony for this incredible conversation tonight. I can think of no better introduction, Ebony, to your exhibition. Uh, and as such a beautiful description, too, of how it is going to transform over the seasons with the different plantings, some of which will be allowed to die beautifully, I've been told. Uh, so we'll get the, the full experience. But thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.